some people here have at least tried the paleo diet before. I prescribe this to a lot of my patients and um, what else? We do, I'm trained in family practice and also integrative medicine as well as functional medicine. So, um, I don't know, that's probably enough of an introduction for me. So, how many CrossFitters do we have out there tonight? All right, a good number of you. So, and how many, so the other people I assume are not CrossFitters and um, saw the flyer posted someplace and decided to show up, so. Well, thank you. Um, so, when Angie asked me to do this talk, I thought, okay, well, what is the modern paleo lifestyle? And I was like, gosh, you know what? I'm not sure because I've never really even heard of the term. So I think she either made it up or the marketing department did and put it on the posters. So the first thing I decided to do, when you don't know what something is, what do you do? You Google it, right? So this is what I came up with. So says modern paleo up there, stocking the wily vegans of Park Slope, barefoot showering, and true report, my LDL is 396. So obviously this isn't local to us. I, I believe Park Slope is what, Chicago, New York, someplace like that. At least I don't think there's a Park Slope in Viroqua, but I know there are vegans out there. Um, so and then I was like, well, okay, I didn't get a good answer, so I'm gonna have to use my brain to think about what modern paleo lifestyle might be. And so I came up with what is the modern paleo lifestyle? What well, has to do with how you eat, move, and sleep? So first we gotta define maybe what the problem is and why we have the paleo diet. So the modern predicament right now, it can be summed up as that we are essentially zoo humans. So what, what does a zoo human mean? And basically we're not living in our natural environment. So, um, you know, most of us out there work in a job, we work indoors, mostly everybody here, I'm guessing. A lot of us sit at desks all day. It's not really what the human body was designed to do. And to top this off, we eat artificial foods, industrial foods that um, are really not what we were meant to eat. And so it's similar to when you go to a zoo and you see animals in a cage. I mean, their environment is very constricted. A lot of times they're indoors. They're getting food that's, you know, processed by and designed by some veterinarian. So, and the thing that links us to those animals in the zoo is a lot of those animals, like us, if you were to release us in our natural environment, we probably would not be able to sur survive at this point and probably not thrive. This is a slide where you can see these women and these spectators. You know, they're wearing their clothing that's been manufactured and processed in a plant somewhere. They're in this cage basically protected so the lions um, don't eat them, which, you know, we're fortunate enough today there's not a lot of uh, human predators out there, just a handful. Um, if you look back over here, you can see there's another fence keeping the lions in, so it's like a double zoo going on there. Um, but if you think about those people in that cage, if you let them out there, uh, if you put them against the lions and I were a betting man, I would probably bet for the lions if they got hungry enough. And also in that natural environment there, those people would not know how to clothe themselves, what to eat, or how to stay warm. So how does the human body respond to this kind of artificial environment that we've been thrust into, particularly in the last 100 years or so? Um, well, it responds with diseases of civilization. So diseases of civilization are, di are diseases uh, such as diabetes and insulin resistance, uh, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, uh, cancer, depression, poor dental health, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so why are these diseases of civilization? Like everybody just gets that stuff, right? Well, wrong. Those diseases are rarely seen in hunter-gatherer populations. So, um, you know, going back to this slide, and I'm gonna throw in history and tidbits and kind of resources and stuff as I go along. Poor dental health is an interesting one because you're probably thinking, right, like hunter-gatherers, like they don't brush their teeth. So, but this, what's fascinating is, is kind of some of the um, research that a lot of these theories developed out of. Uh, Weston A. Price, anybody heard of Weston A. Price? So he was a dentist back in the early 1900s who wanted to find out what caused cavities. So he went around 
And at that point in time, he was able to um, go around and visit like hunter-gatherer populations or people uh, following a more traditional diet that were getting indoctrinated into the Western ways of eating. And he went around, he'd try to find twins whenever he could. And a lot of times he'd have twins, uh, a set of twins where one was eating the Western, the newly adopted Western diet, which is even still probably pretty healthy by today's standards. Uh, and compared to a twin who was, you know, eating the traditional way. And what he found is the teeth of the people eating the Western diet were terrible. They had lots of cavities. The teeth on the people of the people eating the traditional diet looked very robust and healthy. Uh, and in the hunter-gatherer populations, they would also have kind of a fine fuzz or film over them. <laughs> but they would be cavity-free, very strong. This work inspired a guy named Dr. Pottinger who studied cats then and their dentition. And the interesting thing that he found is he grouped the cats into those that they ate raw meat. He had another group that had like dairy products and another one he fed basically off of sugar and grains. And the, what he found was that dental malformations got passed on to the subsequent generations in those cats who were subsisting off of dairy or the grains and sugars and um, continued his experiment long enough that the grains and sugars group went about four or five generations and then was no longer able to reproduce. So come some interesting stuff. I know you're not cats, but it's still interesting to look at that and be like, hmm, there might be something to this. Another story, guy in uh, Australia uh, an aborigine who lived in the outback came in to one of these outposts and um, lived there for a little while, was seeing the doctors there, got diabetes, got high blood pressure. Eventually they told him, you know what, just go back out in the outback. And the guy did, and he came back sometime later, and he did not have those conditions anymore. His blood pressure went back down, his, his diabetes went away. So, so there's some interesting anecdotal evidence out there as to why you know, eating a Paleolithic style diet might be healthy and disease preventing for people. So basically right now we're living in a state of genetic and environment mismatch. So our genes right now don't match what our environment is as we sit in this artificially lit basement that's very warm. Um, so Human history, if you break it down, humans have been around for a million, two million years, give or take. Um, if you condense that into one calendar year, so we're taking all of human, human history and we're putting it into one year, we have had agriculture for three days out of that year. And our modern industrial food supply has been, you know, a few minutes. So when you start looking at things that way, our genes have not changed that much from when we were hunter-gatherers. There's a few exceptions in Northern Europeans. There's a gene that has changed um, in some people that allows them to keep um, lactase going in their body past like infancy and toddlerhood, um, allowing them to consume milk without getting a lot of gastrointestinal distress. But uh, aside from that, we don't know of really any big genetic things that have happened since we were hunter-gatherers. So basically we are a bunch of hunter-gatherers sitting here living in this environment that is no longer appropriate to our genetic makeup. So, Good Calories, Bad Calories. This is a book by a guy named Gary Taubes who spent seven years, this guy isn't a doctor or anything, but he's a science journalist. He spent seven years researching this book. So this guy's thing is he's looking at carbohydrates specifically. So not necessarily a paleolithic diet, but there, there's some tie-in between the two. And very fascinating historical account because everybody thinks low carbon, they think of who? Atkins, yeah. So, and you think like, oh, Atkins started low carb and that started back in like early 2000s, right? Wrong. This guy look, looks at the whole history of it, actually goes back to a guy named, uh, uh, let's see, William Banter in England in the 1850s, who was a big fat dude who decided to give up carbs and like lost weight. So, and then it was a diet fad in England at the time called Banterism. So this book is full of very interesting information. The reason I bring it up is because a lot of the benefits that people were seeing by trying a Paleolithic diet, which we'll get to if anybody's un unfamiliar with it, but 
um, were attributed to the fact that it was a low carbohydrate diet. So, interestingly, so this guy details all that health benefits. It's a good book, but it's a thick read, so just be warned if you pick that up. I don't want to take responsibility. Um, so this guy, Stefan Lindbergh, who was studying a uh, hunter-gatherer tribe, uh, the Catavans. And Catava is an island off of the uh, Papua New Guinea, which is off the African coast. And what he found is the same thing as, as any other hunter-gatherer population uh, that was studied. The interesting thing about the Catavans was that they had pretty high levels of starch in their diet. They eat mostly fish, uh, coconut products, and then sweet potatoes. And so they had a lot of sweet potatoes in their diet, so they had you know, pretty, a pretty good carbohydrate intake, but we're seeing the same benefits as kind of like, you think of like hunter-gatherer and, and um, people, and you think of like the Eskimos, right? Because what the Eskimos eat? They eat meat. That's like all they eat, you know? They're like, you know, they're, they're not the people that like, oh, I'm gonna go have a big steak tonight. They're like stoked if they can get like a salad or something, you know? So, so it showed that regardless of kind of macronutrient content, being protein, carbs, and fats, that the um, Paleolithic diet kind of spills over the effects across the board. So the macronutrient content doesn't really matter. What really drew me to the Paleolithic diet was a course I took after medical residency um, with a group called Global Medicine. And for part of that, they had, they had us read this paper, Origins and Evolution of the Western Diet, Health Implications for the 21st Century, by a guy named Lauren Cordain. And this paper, when I read it, I was straight out of residency. I was still hardcore, like, American Heart Association, like, we gotta lower your fat down or you're gonna die. Um, I myself, um, kind of part of my history is like, I've always been interested in health. That's why I went into medicine. And I got in medical school and, you know, it was hard and went through the first couple of years and I kind of realized like, hey, we're not gonna talk about health here. Health is basically, you don't have a disease and we're just, we're really only studying disease. <laughs> so I was kind of young and naive, but like, I've always been interested in it. So I, I've done a lot of different diets and tried them just to, see like, okay, this is a healthy way to eat. I'm gonna try it. So I was vegetarian for 11 years. I was vegan for a short period of time. Um, all sorts of different things. Um, so when I read this paper, what he said in his paper made a lot of sense to me. And it's kind of the stuff that I'm conveying to you, to you guys tonight. And so I read it and I was like, you know what? That's not what I believe in, but you know what he's saying really, really makes sense. So, um, and this quote in particular here, although dairy products, cereals, refined sugars, refined vegetable oils, and alcohol make up 72.1% of the total daily energy consumed by all people in the United States, these types of foods would have contributed little or none of the energy in the typical pre-agricultural hominin diet. So anyway, I was like, oh, this Lauren Cordain, like, he has an interesting idea. I think I'm going to go ahead, and I got his book, The Paleo Diet. We had to, like, then follow through with some kind of project, not related to this paper, but we just had to make some lifestyle change. This paper had really struck a chord with me, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go on this diet for two weeks and, and see what happens. This is kind of what I call old school paleo now, because this is kind of out before the popularity of paleo has grown within the past five years or so. And so this guy, all the rules are the same except you can't have sodium. So this was like, this was really tough. This was a tough two weeks. And um, I probably wasn't eating enough, but what I noticed was that my energy levels went up. I stopped having gas all the time. And those two, those two were big. And the thing that was big about that we want to have more energy, right? But the thing that was big is this is the first diet that I had tried that I actually noticed a difference in how I felt. So being vegetarian, you know, all these other crazy diet things I, I tried, alkaline diet, I mean, yeah, like 
I was like, yeah, this is a healthy way to eat. And I felt healthy because I felt like I was doing something for my health. And obviously, a lot of those diets don't allow like Snickers bars and that stuff. But this was the first one where I actually felt and noticed a difference. So this is what kind of drew me into paleo and to research it further. Um, as far as like when did paleo start? Well, it started with our ancestors, but really like more modernly, uh, um, Boyd Eaton, a radiologist, actually wrote a paper for the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1985, an editorial, Paleolithic Nutrition, a Consideration of Its Nature and Current Implications. And that's what, what kind of spawned this whole thing. Lauren Cordain read it, he liked it, he went and studied with, with Boyd. Um, and so then he wrote his book, and then uh, Rob Wolf, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, he's a pretty popular paleo advocate. He's done a lot for bringing it into people's consciousness. Um, currently uh, studied with Lauren Cordain. So this has all been kind of going on since 1985. And we get into the concept of lost birthrights. Or I originally had stolen birthrights, but you know I don't know that anybody necessarily stole them. I think they're more just like lost. And it's going beyond like paleolithic diet and just just thinking like as a human like are, are, you know, what, what are we entitled to? And like, this gets on a deeper discussion, but you know, kind of looking at the plight of the world that we're in now, kind of seeing how fragile all our systems are, whether it be the planet or, you know, when a disaster hits, what happens? And our lost birthrights are those that we kind of were talking about in the beginning. You know, being able to sur survive in the natural human habitat, you know, can you, can you obtain food? Can you obtain shelter? using nothing but natural materials. Can you, who here knows how to start a fire by friction? Or has done it? Somebody's kind of, you've done it? All right, so one person. So let's say like some wizard, evil wizard comes along and zaps away all our modern technology right now, including our buildings, like I'm gonna be hanging out with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a picture of a bow drill which is kind of one of the more common ways of uh, creating fire by friction. I mean, we don't think about this stuff right now. It's, it's like, it just seems like something as humans like we should know how to do. All right, let's do some compare and contrast pictures here. So this is a guy who's part of a like sea gypsy tribe. So they're kind of like hunter gatherers uh, and they just go on their boats around the islands, I believe around the Philippines, although I could be wrong and get their food from the earth. So let's see how we get food. All right, now this one is reasonably slender. That's the first thing I notice. Um, she actually has some bananas in her cart, so that's good. Um, and you can see everything's nicely processed and packaged. If you look at caloric expenditure, you know, look at what this guy's doing to get a fish. And here she can I don't know how much money she has on her. In fact, I don't see that she's carrying a purse or a wallet. Maybe she's gonna steal that food, I don't know. But, you know, really she has all that food available to her to the limitations of how much she wants to eat or how much money she has in her pocket. Now let's take it a slide further. Now a lot of the fish, if you buy it in the box at your supermarket, this is where it's gonna come from. This is farmed fish. So you can kind of see like, yeah, there's that, but I'd rather eat what this guy's gonna get and hopefully he gets something. Which is interesting too, the farmed fish thing. I was just um, public radio last week, I was listening and they said that out on the northeast coast of New England and up into Canada, they're not, nobody's allowed to fish cod right now for six months, there's a moratorium because the, the fishery there is so low that the, they need the populations to recover there. So, you know, we're kinda, we're in a bit of a pinch as humans right now. There's a guy with the fish. Now, I don't think this is the same guy, but this is one of the, the people of the, one of these sea gypsy people. And you notice he's wearing goggles, and it's really interesting. This is actually, this is part of a documentary, I think on National Geographic. He fashioned those goggles out of materials he found washed up on the shore. So those are actually like Coke bottle bottoms that are, that, that he's using, so, so it uh, protects his eyes. And, uh, 
I didn't, I didn't have time to find the clip, but it's pretty interesting because this guy jumps in and he basically just walks along the sea bottom and he's holding his breath for like three minutes while he just walks around with his spear looking for a fish. So pretty fascinating. I mean, those are some of the lost skills that, I don't know, has anybody done that before? <laughs> yeah, I don't even need to ask that one. So here's another guy and he has a nice leg of a hooved animal there and he's got a smile on his face he's gonna eat tonight so that's that's how he's getting his red meat bam that's how we're getting our red meat so um, this is a confined uh, agricultural feedlot operation like I a lot of people and I experienced this too I ended up eating a lot more meat because when you take out the grains that's like really calorie dense food and you've got to replace those calories uh, somehow. The first two weeks that I did it with Dr. Cordain's book, I was hungry a lot of the time, to be honest. And then when I went back and, and um, experimented it, with it more, I realized like, man, I'm gonna have to eat way more meat than what I ever conceived was healthy. Um, we're really lucky in this area, so uh, talk to local farmers, see if you can buy half a beef or quarter of a beef. Um, Depending upon who you talk to or where you get it from, it'll run, what, like three, four dollars a pound, would you say? Judy, was that about right? So it's pretty cool the first time you do it. Um, sometimes there'll be stuff up on banners list too. Are you familiar with banners list? Yeah. Um, talk to me afterwards and I can maybe give you some names. Um, there's, so there's these, some of the local farmers will have like a grass-fed cow and they'll, they'll um, want to sell it, but they'll sell it by like the quarter. First time I did this, it was totally awesome because I like went in, I paid them, you know, several hundred bucks, but then I just started carrying these boxes of beef to my car. Yeah, so that definitely makes the meat um, um, much more affordable. If you go to the co-op where they have grass-fed beef, you're looking at like $8 a pound of just ground, ground hamburger. Um, other, the farmers also sell, there's a number that'll sell hogs now, chickens, I don't know. Um, I have a hard time finding chickens. I end up getting those um, probably from the co-op. And then vegetables, the farmer's market is incredible here in the summers. Uh, if you don't want to grow your own garden or don't have time, you could certainly overbuy at the farmer's market and do canning and stuff too. I mean, like compared to living, I moved here from Minneapolis, so to walk away from the farmer's market with like two shopping bags full of vegetables and, you know, I've just spent 20 bucks, I mean, you know, I'm like looking behind me for the police to pull up, you know, so, so that, those are ways that you can really, and we're lucky in this area to have those resources because if we, like I said, if we're in a big city, it'd be a lot tougher. These are Catavans, I believe, as well. And you can see that these women uh, are carrying on their backs, like it looks like they've collected a bunch of tubers. You got this little boy in the front here who's carrying a bird that he likely um, hunted. And then, so that's kind of how they gather their plants that they eat. And here's how a lot of us gather ours. Now, like I said, Verroque was an exception. We have a lot of good access. Uh, exceptional access to local organic fruits and vegetables and then this is like just so we set the record straight I took a picture of this at the local co-op organic lollipops I just I always get a chuckle when I walk by and see those because even if you make crap organic it's still crap so just be wary because all things that appear healthy aren't always healthy sorry for any co-op employees who might be out there. I mean, you know, props to them for trying to make Halloween a little bit better for our kids. Oh yeah. So, dairy. You know, this is Wisconsin, so we're like the dairy state. So, I was a little nervous actually when I came here and I was like, you know what, I need to get some people on the paleo diet. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm new to Wisconsin. I've never lived in Wisconsin. I'm like, Wisconsin's really like the dairy state. They're really known for cheese and cows and milk production and I was like, I don't know, are people gonna be mad at me if I tell them not to eat dairy? So, but if you wonder why our hunter-gatherers don't have dairy, let's say Josh and I are sitting here, we're sitting in our little leopard skin things, you know, and, and we're kinda hungry, we're like, 
maybe we just got a good workout at the wellness center. We're like, we could use some milk, you know, get that protein, build our muscles up. So we're sitting there and like, I'm looking at that thing. I'm like, Josh, you can go milk it. So, <laughs> so really actually dairy came after the advent of, of agriculture because we had to domesticate um, animals before we could milk them. And we're the only species that takes the milk of another species and, and consumes it. So. so what are we looking for? What's the answer? So first of all, it's how we eat, move, and sleep. The first component is the paleo diet, which some of you have tried. You've probably all heard about it. And this is really like, for you guys out there who are taking notes, this is it right here. Oh, no, there's a cartoon. Something's just not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we all get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. So paleo diet consists of meat, seafood, and eggs, vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds. What you can't have is no grains, no dairy, no legumes, no sugars, or sweeteners, and no alcohol. Now you're going to go out on the internet and find uh, variations of the paleo diet. Because it's gotten popular, people are trying to put their own spin on it. You know, we don't know exactly what our ancestors ate. We probably all came from different parts of the world. And the diet really depended on what was available to the people who were living there. But what we can make a pretty good guess about is what they were not eating. So, you know, they weren't eating grains. They weren't eating dairy, legumes. So all the things that came after we developed agriculture. And it goes without saying no sugars or sweeteners and no alcohol. The one that I like to use is the Whole30. So Whole30.com. That should be on your uh, handout sheet. And I heard an interview with these guys and started following their blog. And a lot of the conclusions I was coming to in terms of, of nutrition and what the best way to eat was were the same things that they were kind of, uh, same conclusions that they were coming to as well. So Whole30.com, there'll be a lot of information there. They have a book too, it starts with food. And the original Whole30 had some swear words in it. A patient came in, I was like, you know what? I don't care if people from Wisconsin hate me, if I tell them not to eat dairy, I need to like, since I know that this is gonna be best for their health from everything that I've learned, I'm gonna have to tell them to do this. So I was starting to sit down to write my own diet plan um, for the Paleolithic diet. And then I thought, I was like, you know what? This whole 30 is out there. And yeah, there's some cuss words in there and they use the term F-bomb in it. But I should just print that out because like that's way better than anything I could possibly write. Um, so I started doing it and I'd cross out the swear words by hand with each copy I printed out for people. These guys got more attention and so they took the swear words out, cleaned it up and made it look more professional. Um, in the course of working with patients, um, one of my patients had contacted them through the internet saying like, hey, what about wild rice or some question like that? And then I got a call from Melissa Hartwig saying, wow, you know, there's a doctor like using our thing. So they asked me to write the foreword for their book. So I'm actually in that book, which is now a New York Times bestseller. They're working on their second book. And this just kind of details a lot of the successes I was having in clinic by prescribing people the Paleolithic diet. When you apply this to certain disease states, I've seen some really amazing things happen. I've seen somebody cured of asthma. I've seen high blood pressure go away. Um, you know, I ran a Whole30 group. Um, Last year, um, just for the community, about 30 people did it. Um, somebody there uh, stopped taking chronic pain medications because their pain went away. So there's been a lot of really, really exciting things to see when I use this in a medical setting. I, I've given it to a lot of people. I haven't kept track and I wish I had, but I'm guessing it's well over 100 at this point. I've had I count the people who don't receive any benefit at all from this diet, and so far that's been five. So I'm not gonna get into the technical stuff too much, but basically benefits, it helps it balance your hormonal profile, it helps your gut health, which you're probably, if you're interested in health and reading um, internet articles, you probably heard of the microbiome and taking probiotics. It's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's also what I consider an elimination style diet and also helps with food psychology. And that's why I really like the Whole30 people because they really, in their four page, you know, Whole30 program, like here's the nuts and bolts of it. They acknowledge that, like probably two pages of it is like, look, 
Giving up heroin is hard. Drinking your coffee black is not hard. So they, they take an approach that they call tough love, which I'm a huge proponent of. You know, hormone-wise, you know, we talked about the carb thing, which I thought was interesting. You know, it's not necessarily a low-carbohydrate diet, but when you compare it to what most Americans are eating, going back to one of those first slides where, you know, 72% is, you know, dairy cereals, refined sugars, refined vegetable oils, and alcohol, um, when you take those out, the carbohydrates do tend to come down, which can, in turn, can help regulate insulin levels and blood sugar levels. This is a, th I thought this slide was interesting. This is a chart, uh, U.S. sugar consumption. And like around 1940, there's a dip, and that's because of World War II. But we used to, around 1820, we'd have about five pounds of sugar per person per year. I've seen different statistics for this. This chart shows it not going up quite as high, but I've read as high as uh, recently, like 160, 165 pounds a year. Gut health. One of the big things it does is eliminate gluten. Um, the book Wheat Belly was on the New York Times bestseller list for a long time, actually written by a cardiothoracic surgeon from Milwaukee. One of the things that gluten contains is a molecule called zonulin, which actually punches holes in your gut. And, when, and humans are really just like, they're like big donuts. So you got the inside stuff, and then you got the outside stuff, but you're like a donut in that like from your mouth down to your anus, that's kind of like the outside of your body as well. So, but we spend a lot of time carefully preparing bits of our environment to ingest in there. Um, so when you have something that's poking holes in that, that's not good. Um, I think there's another slide on gluten. Um, but basically, um, you can it's a mechanism for developing autoimmune disease. Um, benefits to the microbiome, so that's your gut bacteria. And also, you know, consuming this diet helps decrease your gut inflammation. Uh, celiac disease insights, clues to solving autoimmunity. This is uh, talking about gluten like I was just telling you. This article came out in 2009 and was revolutionary because we kind of had a few ideas about how autoimmune disease might develop, but uh, the guy that wrote this was really on to something with um, when you get holes in your gut, it's called leaky gut. That introduces foreign substances, your immune system responds. Say you have a little bit of chicken cartilage, well, it recognizes that, decides it's going attack to attack it. It may look close enough uh, to human cartilage that your uh, immune system starts attacking your own cartilage. So. Uh, Anti-inflammatory, so basically this has to do with micronutrient uh, density, so the um, amount of uh, vitamins and minerals. Also, you get increased phytonutrients with the increased plant intake. Um, and then it's also um, decreases inflammatory foods, especially sugar is, huge, is largely inflammatory. Uh, gluten as well. It's an elimination diet. So an elimination diet, if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically removing foods that uh, are common causes of food intolerances uh, because there's a lot of food intolerances out there with people that they may not necessarily know about. You take them out and then you reintroduce them and you can kind of see then, oh gosh, wow, I didn't know that like, kind of like my experience, although I, when I first went on the paleo diet, although I didn't do a systematic reintroduction, like all of a sudden I'm not having gas all day long. And then food psychology. So mainly the addictive things are sugar and alcohol that we're taking out. And sugar is huge because it's not widely talked about. There's been a lot of very interesting studies where, you know, they um, trained rats in one study that they had to complete some kind of task. And when they did that, they could either have cocaine or they could have sugar and all the rats overwhelmingly chose sugar none of the rats went for the cocaine they went for sugar they also did a study uh, where they fed um, I can't remember if it was mice or rats this time but fed them a high fat high sugar diet bam took them off of it classic symptoms of withdrawal like the same as if they would have withdrew from <coughs> heroin cocaine some major drug, they were showing the exact same symptoms when they took them off the high fat, high sugar diet. So pretty fascinating. This is, these are just some tables showing, um, this was a study where they, they looked at, they laid out a paleo diet, had, had women consume them and consume the diet and then, you know, this is like, so it looks like 
I don't know if you guys can read that. I'm having a hard time just from right here, but cantaloupe, Alaskan salmon, you know, vegetable salad it looks like, uh, braised pork loin for dinner, uh, another salad, broccoli, uh, beef sirloin tip, mm, uh, strawberries for dessert, for snacks, orange, carrot sticks, celery sticks. It was a 2200 calorie diet. It's just kind of showing the energy they got from it. Uh, followed by the macronutrient ratios. So like we talked about the carb thing, carbohydrates, um, 129 grams. So that's certainly not low carbohydrate. 217 grams of protein though. And fat wise looks like 42 grams. And then it's just showing kind of vitamins and minerals. Uh, the amount is on the left hand column and on the right hand column is the percent of the recommended daily um, allowance. And so they, you can see those numbers are quite high. The only one is calcium. So calcium, you gotta really focus on leafy green vegetables if you're not gonna be doing dairy. And I didn't bring it, but I have a table that shows um, foods that are high in calcium. But you don't need dairy to get your calcium. So that's another, we could talk about that for another half hour. Uh, seven fundamental characteristics of paleo diet. So basically, higher in protein, lower in carbohydrate, higher in fiber, better omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. So omega-3s are the good ones, like the fish oil. Higher potassium, lower sodium for number five. Number six, more alkaline, which I don't know. I don't think that makes a difference. Um, what you'll find is all those alkaline promoting diets are basically paleolithic diets. Oh, and then higher nutrient density on number seven there. You know, if you really take this to the next level and you look at our hunter gatherers, like they would have this time too. And so they didn't eat like the same thing every day, which like is what we as a society kind of think of as like, this is a healthy diet. This is what I eat every day, but they would hit lean times too. And so, you know, if you look at eating seasonally, their diet in January would probably have been more dependent on protein. We're suspecting, and there's no studies that says this, but we're guessing just based upon looking outside our window that they're gonna be relying more on animal foods um, and probably less on vegetables. Whereas, you know, the season that we just came out of, like kind of late fall is when really they'd have probably more carbohydrates in their diet and have, because there's a harvest and lots more fruits. All right, common misconceptions against an ancestral or paleo diet. Number one, grains and dairy are particularly nutritious. Um, no, they're not. Uh, <laughs> oh, you want me to say more, okay. Um, <laughs> So really grains, like if you look at micronutrient densities, the, um, and be careful when you Google this stuff because there's a lot of vegan groups out there that have these micronutrient density tables. And so um, what they do to kind of skew the deck in their favor towards a vegan diet, and it's not that I'm against vegan diets. I just don't think that, that they're the healthiest necessarily. And you can say, you know, for example, I was vegetarian for 11 years. For, Part of that was in college. In college, I woke up, I'd go to the cafeteria, I'd have a bowl of granola with milk on it. Lunch and dinner, grilled cheese and fries. So, I mean, that's, you know, anybody can tell me it's not healthy, but hey, it's vegetarian. Vegetarian's more healthy, right? So, um, but yeah, there's so, in nutrition we have essential amino acids, which are proteins, and essential fatty acids, which are components of fat, there are no essential carbohydrates whatsoever. And so grains have a little bit of nutrition, but compared to like replacing those with fruits and vegetables, like no way, they don't even come close. So um, one will experience some kind of, of deficiency. We touched on calcium a little bit, so you need to be careful with that. Make sure you're getting good calcium containing foods in your diet. Otherwise, no, you're not gonna get any nutritional deficiency. In fact, your, your intake of um, micronutrients is gonna be probably better than, uh, for sure better than a standard American diet. Um, the only place to get fiber in the diet is from grains and legumes, not true, fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, the paleo diet is unsustainable. This kind of goes back to like, you know, besides what you're eating, it's also important what the source of that is. And so, yeah, with our current agricultural system, like going back to that slide with the, with the feedlot operation, we're not gonna be able to have everybody eating a paleo diet. 
because it takes a lot of energy input to produce meat that way. But if we change to a grass-based agricultural economy where you just have cows, like I have a bunch of land around my house and it's just, you know, it's not being farmed, it's just a bunch of grass. Like if you just feed the cattle on the, f on the food that they're supposed to eat, that just grows on its own anyway, then it's, um, the studies have shown that it's less environmental impact than how we're currently doing it. So, so it is actually sustainable. And when that evil wizard comes and takes away all our technology, you got some survivalists out there who have like a year's worth of food and guns like stocked away someplace. But once that runs out, we're gonna, everybody's gonna be eating the paleo diet anyway. And so I won't even have to talk about it. Um, so and then the other misconception, paleo diet will clog your arteries and give you heart disease. Well, no, and that's interesting. I, I didn't bring the article in or put it in the slide, but I'm thinking I should. It's an article about two cardiologists, one promoting a vegan diet, the other one saying paleolithic diet is most healthy for your heart. So, and there's a lot of debate, cholesterol and stuff we could spend another couple hours on, but, um, the bottom line is that the low fat thing kind of from the 90s and that, you know, we're seeing that fat's actually good for you. In fact, uh, Ansel Keys was a professor at University of Minnesota. He's known for a number of things. One, have you ever heard the term K-rations for like troops? He, he developed those, so K-rations, K for keys. Second of all, he took conscientious objectors in World War II and they said, okay, you can do a study on them. So he did a starvation study on them, many of which were scarred for life afterwards. It was kind of this borderline ethics kind of study. And then the other thing too, he had a study called the Seven Countries Study, which got us our whole cholesterol thing, that lower cholesterol is better for heart health. And if you go back and you look at the history of this, everybody bought into it. This guy was like very persuasive. He looked at data from all these countries, how much fat they ate, how much heart disease they had. Basically, took the seven ones that showed that the less fat you ate, there was less heart disease. The, the countries such as France, where they ate more fat and had less heart disease, he threw those out and made this whole cholesterol hypothesis. This is Time Magazine. This is probably from within the past 10 years. Cholesterol, you got frowny bacon and eggs. I just still eat it. But then, this is more, more recently, uh, this summer, the cover says eat butter and so there's been some more research into this and fat isn't like a bad thing for your heart necessarily in fact they're saying it could actually be good but like I said this is the longer discussion for another time myplate.gov I put this in you know this is kind of replaced the food pyramid so you can see fruits grains vegetables dairy protein which I thought was hilarious because I think they meant meat but I think they're trying to include the vegetarians I guess but really this is more like what, what it should look like. Plants, animals, some water. Top fat sources, fatty ocean fish, uh, coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil, avocados. Ocean fish, get, get an app for your smartphone. I think I put it on the sheet because really we want to be eating our ocean fish sustainably and we also want to watch it for toxins. So that Android one is actually the better of the two because it takes all those into account, gives you a little stoplight system, like green means good, go for it. Red means bad, don't do it. And then there's a yellow, like, well, okay, you're gonna be breaking you know, either the sustainability component or you're gonna be eating toxins. Plant-based diet, so this is a term too I want you to look out for in the media. Plant-based diet, the vegans have kind of co-opted this term to be a vegan diet. But really, if you think about the Paleolithic diet, it is a plant-based diet as well. And I like this pyramid because it has vegetables and fruits kind of as the base and then meat the next, the next rung up. But I really think of it as a plant-based diet because all these animals I eat have done a v very valuable service that I'm very thankful for them to, and they have eaten plants and turned it into a rich source of protein for me. And this is for the CrossFitters. Eat meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. Keep intake to levels that will support exercise, but not body fat. Sound familiar, right? Sounds like basically a paleo diet. Greg Glassman, and he was the, the founder of CrossFit. So, like what is the paleolithic way to exercise? Like, our hunter-gatherers did not exercise. Not that we know of. They were active because they can't get in their car, drive to the store, and get their food. So they had to get out and like 
walk around, find it. They were active doing that. It goes back to the slide that has, has the guy jumping off his boat to spear a fish. So sitting is the new smoking. I don't know if you guys have heard that, but there, the new research coming out is that the longer you sit, the higher mortality rate you have, the sooner you will die. Um, the incredible thing now is like to solve this problem, they've come up with treadmill desks. So I actually have a standing desk that I use sometimes in my office um, because it's comfortable. But, you know, so they have these studies that say, all right, sitting's linked to earlier mortality, but how do we know it's the, the sitting itself? How do we know it's not the mind numbing work that we do on computers all day long that's doing it instead? And maybe like, making yourself uncomfortable, um, you know, walking on a treadmill. Uh, who says that's gonna make you live any longer? Um, plus it's just very depressing, I think, a very depressing solution. And also dangerous, you know, what if you like manage to log into Facebook uh, on work time and oh, there's a birth announcement, oh, holy, oh, you know, next thing you know, you're flat on your face. So be careful with those. It's a little bit akin to this, which like, not just a treadmill, but it's like a human hamster wheel, expending energy, but going nowhere. And this was just what I was saying, our hunter gatherers didn't really exercise, but had an active lifestyle by virtue of fulfilling their own survival needs. The one thing that we know is that they walked a lot. Hadza, the Hadza populations um, in Africa were found to walk about seven miles a day. So, we knew that they all walked a lot. And then there was probably bursts of sprint type like activity. And this is, a, this is from a guy named Mark Sisson. And he published a book called The Primal Blueprint. And this is kind of his movement recommendations. And as research comes in, I'm always surprised because like it, for health, it, it kind of corresponds to his recommendations. So he says do a sprint like once every week, once every 10 days do a couple of heavy lifting sessions a week and then try to walk uh, for like two to five hours a week, basically. Footwear, uh, this is another component. You know, we weren't really designed to wear the shoes that we wear today. It affects our entire body by affecting the way we walk. Obviously, this is an extreme example. This is a more extreme example. I've only seen these in like the online uh, Sky Mall catalogs. I've never seen anybody wearing these, but I'm really excited for the day I do see somebody wearing them because <laughs> I'm gonna pull out my phone and get a video of that. This is a really good book, Born to Run. Um, this guy like follows a, a semi-modern people in Mexico, uh, this clan that runs everywhere. They run like They'll just run like 100 miles, and then they, when they get tired, they just stop. They like to drink a lot of this corn alcohol, and they just run a lot. So this is probably one of the best sports books ever written. And then kind of the last component, too, is sleep. So our, we know our ancestors got a lot more sleep than we did because we have access to artificial lights. So I mean, like, if we were hunter and gatherers, we'd be in bed by now. Um, so important, like, one of the important things you can tweak this. Um, Obviously, it's going to be very limiting to your life to try to go to bed at dusk and wake up at dawn. Um, it might get you fired. But the be one of the best things you can do is make your room entirely dark. So, so eliminate all light sources. So make sure that you're, you have shades that block out all of the light. Get rid of that alarm clock. And then uh, put tape over the lights on your smoke alarms even. That's going to help your hormonal profile from a standpoint of light actually affects melatonin levels, um, you'll be able to sleep a lot better if you do those things. No screen time two hours before bed because screens emit light that uh, signal uh, our hormones that it's not time to go to bed yet. And then try to sleep seasonally too. So I kind of alluded to this about going to bed at dusk, waking up at dawn, but get more sleep in the winter time. I mean, it's the time that all of the earth rests and so, um, you know, there's not as much activity. Um, the days are shorter. So, you know, try getting more rest in the w winter time versus the summer time. How do you start? This has been a ton of information in a small amount of time. I th the first thing I would do is, is go to the whole30.com and or buy their book and start that program. And what it is, is it's a 30 day trial, 100% of a Paleolithic style diet. When you go to the Whole30 thing, one of their tenets is like, don't try to recreate the foods that you're missing 
you know, eat real whole foods, like eat a steak, eat a salad, you know, don't like, don't like try to, you know, make pizza, you know, using almond flour or something, because they want you to do it in spirit as well as, as following the rule, rules. One of the people who came back and did not have any benefit from, from doing the Whole30 um, ate nothing but nuts and dried fruits for the entire month. And so while technically that's within the scope of the rules, it wasn't really with the spirit of things and so didn't get the best results. Second thing, move. I would say, and this is general for everybody, the people who are already working out or the people who aren't, is just put more walking in because we know that that was something that our hunter-gatherer ancestors did. But in addition to that, it's probably a good idea to be doing some sort of resistance training. I should say that for the CrossFitters who are here, very important to make sure you get some post-workout carbohydrates. So don't try to lower your carbohydrates in your diet by too much um, when you're doing those Metcon type of workouts because they're very physically demanding and you're going to need the carbohydrates to recover. And there's a book, The Paleo Athlete by Stephanie Gaudreau. She's a CrossFit athlete. She has an ebook you can get. I think it's 20, 25 bucks. It really tells you like, okay, you're doing CrossFit. Here's what you need to do. So that would be a good resource for you guys to have. The thing that you could, even though I think the diet is the most important thing, the thing that you could do right now too is to start with sleep and just get your bedroom completely dark, start sleeping with the seasons. So, And that's the other thing too that I want you guys to realize is that we are really kind of blessed to be living in this time in history right now because the conversation around food for many, 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 many years and still in some parts of the world today is, will I eat today? And we are lucky enough to be living in this society right now that like geographically, historically, um, you know, we've hit the Powerball basically to live right now. And so now our discussion around food is like, well, what's, what's the best way to eat, you know? What if I want to be healthy? What if I want to be lean? What if I want to get a lot of muscle? Like these are the questions that we're grappling with because we have such a surplus of food and such a caloric surplus. So. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but just to, you know, contemplate that, that like we're pretty lucky to be sitting here with our electric lights talking about this, you know. Well, if anybody has questions that they're too scared to ask in front of the group, they can certainly come up and ask me afterwards. So thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>